He will show up and together you will come together and He will do something phenomenal in your lives. And so as we dedicate the rest of this service today, I want you to pray something like this, as, even as I pray over you today. God, I want to hear you. I want to hear what you would have to say for my life today. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for these moments together. And Lord, we will enjoy all good things. And today, later, we will enjoy a, hopefully a fantastic game and we'll be able to spend some time with friends or family. But Lord, in this moment, Lord, we just know that we need to hear from you. And so God, as we just refocus our, 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 our attention on these few moments, Right now that we have together, may your grace, your power, may your voice speak ever so clearly. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Wow, little symbol there. All right. Just before you are seated, I'm going to have you turn around, shake hands, hug necks, all that kind of stuff. I just, a couple things you need. Before I, you're not listening to me. Oh, you're not listening. I'll get you back in a second. <laughs> grab my tea. <coughs> it's warm in here. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Well, few things you need to know about today. First off, um, we've, uh, we've had some loss in the family this week. Uh, Chris, Chris Lopez lost his dad yesterday, and Chris is right here in the front row, and uh, Chris thrilled to see you today. And uh, also, the Ayers family lost a, a sister last week, and they've just been, a family been joining with us the last several months since about Easter of this past year. And so, um, you know, it's Sometimes we, we, we have loss, and, and so we come into the house, there's all kinds of things going on, so I just want you to be mindful of that, keep these folks in, in extra prayer as, uh, as we go through our day. All right, there's a, there's a familiar scene out of Scripture that I, I bet most of us would be, uh, we would know about, and it's, um, it's where Jesus is talking about the folks that want to get their blessing. They want to get the reward like now. And uh, they're the folks that are out there and they're making sure everyone sees what they're given. Making sure everyone sees how generous they are and, and so on and so forth. And, and folks, um, you know what? Sometimes in life there is immediate blessings. But I can tell you in regards to the things of God that there's a far greater blessing when we learn to give the way God has taught us to give and that we would give in secret. And now that's, that's a little bit mysterious, but I want to explain it to you because it's important to recognize that in all situations, Jesus never says that the giver should not give. But what he does says, in fact, is, is really very important that, that he doesn't even say that there won't be a reward. There is always a reward in giving. Sometimes the reward comes in that moment. But sometimes that reward is something that comes down further down the road. What is super important to understand, because the, the law of giving and receiving really can't be broken. It's kind of like the law of gravity. If you're going to throw a football up today, someone is, that ball is going to come down. Someone's going to try to catch it, right? That's the way it works. When you give, you will receive. But what I want you to understand is that Jesus is always... That's, that's a neat noise. I don't know what that one is. Something back there, huh? Sounds like it. All right. Um... Nope, not me. Jesus is always coaching people towards the biggest and best blessing. Now that sounds odd, but it's absolutely true. What he is saying here is don't settle for the little blessing. Don't settle for the pat on the back uh, from some person, regardless of how important that person may be. Sure, you'll get a reward. Others will think highly of you and the like, but that's only good for a little while. That will, uh, that will bless you a little, that's for sure, but there is a bigger reward. Jesus says you ought to give with the motive of only impressing God. In fact, out of Matthew 6, 4, it says, Your Father who sees 
uh, what is done in secret will reward you. You know, uh, giving, tithing, uh, uh, you know, giving that to what we do with ministry partners around the world is always a faith issue. It's a trust issue. But if we believe in a supernatural God that controls the universe, in other words, runs the world, then we should also believe that he is the rewarder of faith. He is the rewarder of those that honor him and give in secret. And that should give us the confidence to go ahead and take steps of faith. But I've got to warn you that when you begin to follow that which God is calling you to do in regards to giving, it is something that uh, he, will not let, uh, he will not let it go from your life. Because as you give, he will give back to you. As you are uh, uh, faithful and responsible with that which he has given you, he will, be, he will give you more in which to manage. And that's not my rule. That's not my words. That comes from Scripture. And so, folks, know that blessing comes in so many different ways. God can heal in an instant. God can restore relationships that are broken. He can take a mess and make something beautiful. And he can save our loved ones. And the beauty of it all is that he does that. And that's per- part of the reward. And so as we turn our hearts towards giving today, I want to encourage you to reach down now. At this, if you're at the end of the aisle, grab hold of that bucket. Hold it for just a moment, if you would, please. And we're going to receive our morning tithe and offering, that which we are doing for ruin and... Um, Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for every dollar and every dime today. And Lord, we know that um, we can trust you. And that, Lord, that which is done in secret. Someone here in the room is going, well, this isn't so secret. We're we're about to pass a bucket. Well, Lord, I understand that, that we do this corporately. But that's why there's some, there, there's some privacy in regards to the envelopes and all those types of different things. Lord, we want, to, we want to be a part of your kingdom good. And as we come together to worship together, this is that opportunity to give. And Lord, I pray that in 2014, that the, the, the financial momentum that was created in the back uh, quarter of, of 2013, not only would continue, but economic renewal, I believe this with all of my heart, would come to this valley and it would flow through San Jacinto Assembly of God. So Lord, I just pray your grace, your power over all of these uh, offerings, tithes today and ask Lord that you would multiply to meet needs. We pray this, we believe this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. You pass that along the aisle and as that's being passed, there's some video announcements for you to see at this time. I'm Margaret with this week's updates. Saving Grace, our coupon affinity group, will meet in a home group setting this coming Monday, February 3rd at 11 a.m. Please mark your connection if you are interested in joining and Leanna Malore will contact you. The Senior Bible Study with John Gifford is also this Monday, February 3rd, here in the box at 7 p.m. It's not too late to help with our missions trip to Rancho de Sus Niños. We would like to bring to the children winter coats, sweaters, socks, soccer balls, basketballs, jump ropes, crayons, and pencils. Please bring your items to the church office. Remember to pick up your script today. If you have any questions about how our script program works, please feel free to stop by the script office and we will be happy to answer any questions you might have. There's always a lot going on here at SJA, so please, Check your connection for more announcements and take this time to silence your cell phones. Thank you, church, and have a blessed week. A little bit of microphone issue with me this morning. Is that it? Is that, are, are we there? All right. So I, I thought I saw you come in. rid of the sweater all right one yeah i guess i'm going handheld today thanks bro oh
Check. There we go. I don't know if I can preach holding a microphone. So here we go. Uh, I was saying that I, uh, I I forgot to mention Emma and your family with the loss this past week as well. So kind of a kind of a crazy deal. It seems like stuff runs and packs that way, and uh, so um, just need to be praying for all of you. Hey, couple couple things this week you absolutely need to know about. On after we finish casting the demons out of our sound system today, but uh, on Wednesday we have our annual business meeting, and um, I know I know it's not the highlight of your year. I understand that. In truth, it's not the highlight of my year either, but it does allow us the opportunity to share about what is going on in, in our coming thing, in our coming year, and I am excited about that because we will take some extra time to. Uh, to talk to you about our goals in 2014 and some of our projects that are being laid out. And we also want to talk to you about, uh, we're just kind of, we're, we're, we're kind of not reinventing Ruin, but our goal for Ruin this year is that everyone in this church would touch Ruin in one form or another. And so we want to present that to you and what that may look like for your, your life and your family. And we also have some ratification of, uh, of a couple new board members. And um, I see Reed. Reed's got a tie on today. Hi, Reed. Good to see you up there. It's tie. And I don't know if Robert, is Robert ushering today or do I see Robert today? I don't know if I see him. Usually he's, uh, he's got a tie on often. Only a few guys wear ties. And so they, that's what happens. You wear a tie, we put you on the board. And so there you go. And uh, so we have to do that ratification this week. And so look forward to you being out. And um, that's at 7 o'clock. We have a great financial report. Uh, to go through with you as well, and so look forward to seeing you then. All right. Have you ever been told you're a good listener? Really? How many of you have been told you're a good listener? See, most, oh, really that many? Have you ever been told that you're a lousy listener? How many of you think of yourself as a good listener? How many of you are going to be a good listener at about 326 this afternoon? What if your spouse comes and sits right in front of you, in between you and the TV, and wants to talk about stuff that's been on their heart for a very long time? And their first words out of their mouth are, this could take a while. Hope you enjoy the dip, because we're going to, I'll just keep filling it up if you listen. So, uh, folks, I know that sometimes there are things in our life that grab at our attention and, and have our, our, our imagination going and everything, and that's all fun. And I think the Super Bowl is a great event and something that we all can enjoy. But I'll tell you what, it, oftentimes it just seems that in life it's hard to listen. And there are times in our life where we know we should be listening, but we put it off because we've got other things on our mind or other things that are grabbing at us. In, in fact, People, when they say, hey, can I talk to you, do you realize how many times that's never a good time? How many times people say, is this a good time to talk? And inside you're going, nope. <laughs> oh, no, this isn't a good time at all. But on the outside you're going, sure, this would be excellent. Oh, that's tremendous. And they just, and they just begin to lay out all this stuff. And, and sometimes I know it's tough to be a good listener. Folks, what, that's not really the point of my whole message today, other than to say this. There's another that we should be listening to very, very intently. And yet, often we don't orchestrate or, or order our day in order that we can hear. And what I'm talking about is the ability to hear from God. And that is something that some people go, oh, I don't know about that. I have never heard from God. There are people in this room today going, how does that work? And others going, man, I hear from God all the time. What I want to talk to you about today is how the Holy Spirit enables you to hear from Him. And what's so amazing about it is that this is not kind of spooky or mystical or even weird. As a matter of fact, this is really about understanding some simple things in our life that if we put in proper order, you and I can hear the voice of the Lord. And I'm not saying it's always going to be an audible voice, right? And it doesn't sound like Darth Vader, I don't think like that. But I believe that oftentimes God speaks, and he speaks in a still small voice. And so I want to talk to you about that today and how that can work in your life. Luke 8, uh, verse 11 through 15 is the explanation of the parable, and it says this. This is the meaning of the parable. The seed is the word of God. Those along the path are the ones who hear. And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. 
Those on the rocks are the ones, and this is the seed, are the ones who receive the word with joy when they hear it, but they have no root. They believe for a while, but in the time of testing, they fall away. The seed that fell among the thorns stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, <coughs> they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures, and they do not mature. But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart, I want you to catch that, who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. Ecclesiastes 5.1 says this, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they do wrong. Now, when we're talking about hearing from God, I got to tell you that for a lot of folks, they're going, I don't know. There's, a, there's that little creepy feeling going, can it really be? Folks, after we fin this, finish this message today, you're going to realize how simple this really is. But the first key that we have to understand is that often there are voices in our head. Now, some of you, I, that's another sermon altogether to ask if you have voices in your head today, all right? But oftentimes, what, 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 I, what I'm meaning in regards to voices in our head is the distractions that are going on in our lives. And the first distraction that happens in our life really is the evil one, Satan. Sometimes people go, do you really believe that there's, there's an evil one? Do you really believe that there's a devil? And I absolutely believe that there's a devil. There's no reason in the world for me not to think that. But what happens is that sometimes we, we, we kind of think that, you know, the devil, well, he doesn't really have, and he has no influence on my life. And while as believers we are given authority over the evil one, what happens sometimes is that our guard gets down. Or there are things going on around our life that are being influenced by the powers of evil and we're maybe not always discerning or aware of it. Scripture teaches us that the devil is, is like that roaring and prowling lion looking for someone to devour. And while we may always say, well, I've got power over that, that's right. But I want you to understand that there is an evil one that wants to destroy you. Does not like you very much and wants to cause harm or difficulty in your life. And that's one level, but there's another extreme that then just attributes everything to the devil. And most of this crowd is way too young to remember Flip Wilson. But he said, the devil made me do that, right? And there are those that just attribute everything that could possibly go wrong to the evil foundation that comes uh, uh, from the enemy. And, and folks, that's another extreme. What we have to understand is that there needs to be discernment in our life. There needs to be, uh, there needs to be um, what I call a sense of understanding and listening to God's voice when the, when the voice of the enemy seems to be very, very loud. Luke 8, uh, 12 says, And then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts. And when I, when I see that, I think to myself, you know what? We need, to be, we need to be aware of that happening. We need to be, understand that that's what happens in people's lives, that the enemy comes and there's been a seed planted, but the enemy comes and he snatches it away. The point of this is that as a, for balance purposes, as a Christian, we, we, we should never not think that the enemy is not trying to influence us. Well, at the same time, recognize that not every voice that is going on in our head is an evil one either, but it is something that we are called to take authority over or to stand over. Sometimes the only appropriate thing to do is to push the mute button in regards to the things of the enemy. And now here's the thing that perhaps m many believers struggle with today is to hit that mute button. Now, folks, the, the, the fact of the matter is that we live in a culture and a context that uh, is pretty, well, just about anything goes. And there are things in my life that I just purposely, if I know better or if I know what's coming, I do not want to see or I do not want to be a part of. I know how to protect my heart. And, and sometimes, uh, even with, there were some things that I knew was coming up on the Grammys last week, and I, I enjoy watching those shows as well, but I knew something was coming, and I purposely went, you know what, that's going to grieve my spirit, I know it already, I'm just not going to watch it, and I didn't watch the show at all. That was guarding my heart, that was, that was removing myself uh, from, any, from any evil that I thought that was present, and I just didn't want to be a part of it. And sometimes we have to kind of stand back and look at that which we call entertainment or that which we are allowing to be fed into our lives. And you know what? We need to hit the mute button. We need to go, you know what? This is not feeding my soul. 
And I, I believe that everything that God gives to us is an opportunity for us to enjoy, but there are things that are out there that are not necessarily for us to consume. And we do consume it, and we consume it in such a way, and we say we have all these types of rights and liberties in the things of God. And I get that. I understand that some things that are right for me are not right for you at all. And that's another sermon that we can touch on another day. But i got to tell you that there are some very things that's, that are up and opposed to the things of the living God that you and I sometimes tolerate. And when we tolerate it, we are just, we're just turning down the volume of that voice. But I'm telling you, you need to mute it. In other words, you need to shut it up. You need to shut it down and move it out from your lives. And now, some of you are going, oh man, that's a little old-fashioned and everything else. I know it's old-fashioned, but remember, I'm old, so it's okay, right? It really is. But again, as I finished the fast, and many of you finished up the fast with this, this past weekend, there was almost rejoicing in our Saturday night crowd last night when we talked about that. I think they were all going out for burgers, right? And... Um, but going through the fast again, I was just reminded, and it was just like my heart was on high alert to the things that come into my household that I have the ability to shut off. And if I don't shut off, whose fault is that? Who do I have a responsibility over? My family. And if I don't have a standard, how can I expect them to have a standard or to turn off the things that I think are inappropriate if I am not doing that before them and modeling that? And so it may sound like an old-fashioned standard, but i got to tell you, if you want to hear the voice of God, then you need to mute the voice of the enemy in your life. The second thing that has to be muted is your own voice. Sometimes you talk to God, and it's a one-way conversation. It's like emotional vomit all over God. Blah. And you throw up on him, you feel better, and you get out of there. It's true. I watch this all the time. And folks, you know, the, the, the things of self, fear, pride, self-ambition, um past hurts, things that have been going on, just an aside, do you know today in America, today is the day in America where more people will uh, suffer from the hands of domestic violence than any other day of the year? Super Bowl Sunday. It happens every year, statistically speaking. And it happens for a simple reason, someone didn't listen to them. And they got angry, or the game isn't going the right way, and there's a little bit too much alcohol at the party. And someone gets hit, or someone gets pushed, or someone gets yelled at, or screamed at, or left to fend for themselves and to get home. You may hear some things today about human trafficking in regards to the Super Bowl. That seems to be a theme that's coming out, and I don't know how that's going to play out in regards to how they do their advertising today. But these are things that happen in America that are behind the big shiny event that isn't so nice. And that was just an aside. It doesn't have anything to do with my point. But what does have something to do with my point is sometimes we carry things in our life and some of the th hurts or some of the things from our past. And you know what? When we're trying to hear God's voice, what we're really hearing instead is all the pain and all the ugliness and all this other stuff. And we're, we're just not ready to hear God's voice because we're still working through all the stuff that we just have to get out. And there comes a time where your healing must come. But it's so easy to hold on to some of the things of our past. It's, 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 it's the craziest deal. Somehow there's comfort in our pain. And we're not sure that our healing is going to make us better or our healing is really going to move us forward. But I can tell you that to hear the voice of the Lord, we've got to not turn off our own voice because God has given you a voice in your life so that you would have discernment, that you would have the ability to tell what's right and what's wrong. You know, a couple years ago in Rancho Santa Fe, not far from here, remember there was a number of people that took their life. They were living together in a community. And, and when the leader said it was time to, for the spaceship to come, right? And many, many of them died. There were good people in that community that, that uh, unnecessarily died that day because they had turned, uh, they turned themselves right off. And they decided that, you know what, it was just easier to listen to somebody else. 
Folks, what I'm getting at is that God wants to give us discernment and be able to hear the voice of the Lord. We need to have discernment because sometimes the enemy will disguise that voice and he'll say something to you that is just absolutely ridiculous. And we need to have that check and balance in our life, not only the discernment of our lives, but the word of God where we can go and see what's going on. And so we need to be careful about the voice of the enemy. We need to be careful about our own voice. We don't shut it off, but we lower it so we're not doing all the talking with God, but we're listening as well. And thirdly, we need to be careful with the voice of tradition and, the, and, and religious experience. You know, I, I grew up in, in um, um, I grew up going to the altar most Sunday nights. That was my tradition. I grew up going to camp and, and, and to youth camp and kids camp, and, and I got saved probably a thousand times, right? Any, any other thousand timers in the room today? Yeah, you know what I mean, right? Gave my heart to the Lord because I was sure that something was going to happen to me on the way home and I was going to die, and I wanted to make sure I was with Jesus, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. And I was filled with the Holy Spirit at 14 years of age. And I, and I spoke in tongues. And that was, a, that was a, an amazing experience. And I remember it very, very well. I can tell you the place I was standing when it happened. I can see it in my mind's eye. It's a few thousand miles away from here. But sometimes, folks, we, in, in, our, in our attempts to, to, to feel good about our, 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 our relationship with God, we try to rehash that which is old. Or we try to rehash an experience when in fact God wants to do something fresh and new in our lives. You know, there's this crazy little story out of the book of Numbers. And, and I, 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 I knew the story, but I didn't know the context of years until I started to study it a little bit more closely this week. But there in Numbers chapter 21, you know, Moses is leading this motley crew of people that couldn't get into the promised land because there was too much sin in their life. And, and they're wandering through the desert and they're trying to blame Moses for their problems, right? I love when people do not accept sin in their life and they try to make it everybody else's problem. And they were trying to make it Moses' problem and God was aware of this so he allowed snakes to come into the camp and these snakes were poisonous and they were biting people and people were dying. And it became very clear to the people very quickly that their sin, not Moses' leading, but their sin was what caused this pain to happen in their life that was causing death to come into the camp. And so they went to Moses, and they said they were sorry, and they began to repent, but many of them had been bitten, and they were in need of healing, and Moses prays, and Moses does something that it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. But Moses uh, fashioned a serpent out of brass, or out of bronze. What was it? Bronze or brass? i got to think about it. Bronze, right? And he fashions this thing out of bronze, and he puts it up on a stick. And when people looked up to this, this bronze um, uh, snake on a stick, Scripture says they were healed. Now, that's a crazy story. That is just one of those, those moments where I have to say, you know what, God, I don't know why you chose to do that. But you chose to do it, and it seemed to be effective for about a week. But here's what happened. For 700 years, the people of Israel dragged that goofy serpent on a stick all over the place with them. And they were burning incense to it. And they were praying to it. And nothing was happening but their tradition. They had a spiritual moment. I remember when you're... Your great aunt, sister Susie, 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 57 times removed, 700 years ago, was healed by looking at the, at the snake. And they were holding on to this tradition, blinding themselves to uh, what God could do. And it wasn't until Hezekiah came along and started to bust down the altars that had been built up that the things of God started to move and happen again amongst the people. And what I'm getting at is sometimes in our own traditions, in our own faith journey, something significant happens in our life. We need to honor it. We need to remember it. We need to tell the story. But we also have to remember that God also provided fresh manna for them every single day. That every day God was their provider. It also said that Jesus is the bread of life. 
Now, I don't know about some of you. Some of you dropped bread for 25 days here in the fast, and that you probably lost a few, few pounds if you did that and everything else. But what I'm getting at is the fact that God is our sustainer each and every day, and he is capable of doing the fresh and new in you. That should be really exciting. And you're like, well, okay. That's really good. I didn't really like the bronze snake thing anyways. I think that's silly. But what I'm getting at, folks, is sometimes we just hold on to the voice of our past. And again, we can honor it. We can respect it and everything else. But it shouldn't be the dominant voice that we're hearing in our life. The dominant voice should be the voice of God that comes by the way of the Holy Spirit as he speaks into our life and into our soul. And we should desire that. You know, if... If you never talk to someone that you said was your friend, are they really your friend? No. I mean, think about it. I mean, Facebook is this great example for everything, right? And many of you have far too many friends on Facebook. Some of you, I bet, don't even know who those people are, right? Any of you have friends on Facebook, you don't know who they are? Come on, put your hand up. Yeah, absolutely. That's me. I probably have 50 or 60 people. I don't have a clue who they are right? And I don't even know how they got on to my Facebook account. I think, I think my son must have gone through and just hit accept, 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 accept. I don't know. But they're there, right? But they're not really friends. I'm not doing life with them. They don't have a voice in my life. I, I don't, I'm not being mentored. I'm not, I'm not seeing uh, something coming away that inspires or anything like that. But you and I say we're, we're believers in the Most High. And yet, some of us have not heard from God for a very, very long time. We've got a one-way relationship going with Him where we do this emotional vomit, we get everything out. But what's coming back? What are we listening to? What are we doing to begin to hear? And it really, folks, it is a matter of the heart. Luke 8, uh, 15 says, but the seed on good soil stands for those with the noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering produce a crop. If we are going to hear God today, your heart, my heart, needs surgery. It needs to be built, formed, shaped to hear the way he wants me to hear. And for that surgery to happen, I recognize that I must respect, I must fear. Well, Deuteronomy says it well. These words are be, being spoken just after the Ten Commandments have been given. And it says, Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep my command always so that it might go well with them and their children forever. Sometimes... We need that steadfast, well not sometimes, we always need that steadfast heart. Sometimes we have to draw on the strength of that in a given situation. And Psalms 57, 7 says, my heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing and make music. Steadfast, it's firm, it's settled, it's not wishy-washy, it's not fickle, it's, uh, it's not wavering. And I love the fact that this is David saying these words while he is being chased and he is living in caves. And he says his life is not perfect by any, any means, but his heart is steadfast. So folks, you and I not only need to have a good heart, but we need to have a teachable spirit. How many of you know someone, now don't point, because that's rude, right? But how many of you know someone that's unteachable? Do you know anyone that's unteachable, right? Yeah. Aren't unteachable people just the most fun to hang around with, right? Because they're never wrong, right? They always think they've got the answer for everything. And they've got, they, they, they're rarely open to another's opinion. They, they often want to dominate and, and they're kind of like emotional and, 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 and these intellectual bullies and they just want to get their way and they push their way through everything. And I got to tell you, if you want to hear, if you want to hear from God, you got to recognize that you must have a teachable spirit, and for all the craziness that is that is the um, is the disciples, they had a teachable spirit. James 1, 19 through 20 says, My dear brothers, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. 
For man's anger does not bring about the righteous life that God desires. Now, it's funny. I'm, um, I, I guess when I was 20, I think I had it all figured out. <laughs> right? Any other 20-year-olds at that time thought you had it all figured out? And then I hit 30, and I realized that there was a few kinks in my armor. There's a few things that I hadn't gotten quite right or hadn't figured out just the right way. And then this, this thing called 40 comes along. Now I know I'm the only 40-year-old in the room, and 40 comes along, and, and you realize that which you thought was at 20 is absolutely untrue. Or it isn't really what you thought you had a, you, you were not perceiving correctly. And now since I'm on the eve of 50 here in a few years, I wonder how much less I'll know by the time I get then. <laughs> and what I'm getting at is I've learned to be more teachable the older I get. I've learned to be more adaptive and understanding of, of what perhaps I understood or didn't fully understand and I took to the bank, but now I'm grabbing and holding on to and I'm trying to build a solid foundation around. And that's what I love about the posture that the, the, the disciples take. Let me read several scenes very quickly of, as to how the disciples really were teachable. Matthew 13 says this, Then he left the crowd and went into the house. His disciples came to him and said, Explain to us the parable of the weeds in the field. Next one out of Mark chapter 28, or 9, uh, 9 28. After Jesus had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we drive it out in regards to a demon? Mark 10.10, 10, when they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this. And I put in brackets, what were they asking about? He was asking about divorce. Mark 13.4 says, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all to be fulfilled? Again, see the pattern here. The disciples, they're watching Jesus. They're seeing Jesus do ministry. They see Jesus fulfilling that which God has called them to do. And they're watching it, and they have questions. They have a teachable spirit. John 6, 28 says, when they had asked him, then they asked him, what must we do to do the works God requires? And then finally, Luke 11, 1 one day, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place when he had finished. One of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples. So I guess the thing that we have to ask ourselves is this. If we're not hearing from God, do you have a teachable spirit? In other words, are you willing to listen to the input that the Holy Spirit has for your life? Or do you have things so planned out, so down to the letter, that if, if God was to come in, he would mess up your plans, and that's what you're afraid of. And because you're afraid of that, you push him off, and you say, ah, I've got it all right here. I've got this handled. I don't need your help. Folks, I want you to understand that when our heart is good and we have a teachable spirit, then we begin to understand who Jesus really is. And when I look at Jesus' life and when I study him, I, I, I see him in situations just like the disciples saw him in situations. They saw him, um, you know, coming out of the desert where he is needing food. He is needing uh, to be restored. They saw him in situations where, the, where people are trying to trick him and, 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 and try to get him to say things that they're going to hold against him and everything else. And Jesus hung out with some good people, and he hung out with some not-so-good people, and, he, and the people that seemed to be the biggest challenge for him to hang out was with the religious people. And the problem with the religious people is that they were unteachable. They had grabbed onto something, and they were going to live it just that way, and they were not open to what God was doing. And they were holding on to their tradition, they were holding on to it firmly, and they were not allowing the voice of God to be heard in their lives. And so while it sounds strange to us, it's very true and it happens in our own lives today. Sometimes out of our own fear or our own insecurity as to what God wants to do in our lives, we push them off or we say stuff like, I'll deal with that tomorrow. Or that's for another day. I'm not ready yet. Folks, I suspect that God knows when you're ready. 
And I also know that he is trying to get some of our attention and that he is doing this because he wants to talk to you. Now, why does he want to talk to you? Now, probably, okay, let's just be honest. Did you ever get called down to the principal's office? How many of you got called down to the principal's office more than once? Let's see your hand. I can believe it. <laughs> Looking at who raised their hand, I see. I see trouble, 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 trouble. I remember the day the teacher exited the room, came back in and said, Jeff, the principal wants to see you. It was a long walk. We had these, they're kind of like U-shaped buildings. They weren't completely U. They went out like this. It was really wide. And I remember my class was almost down at the end. And to walk down to where the principal office was, down kind of in the middle pod area, was quite a distance. But I got to tell you that with each and every step, I have never prayed so hard in my whole entire life. Right? Those of you that have been to the principal's office, you became very religious. You prayed. You, you fasted on the way. Like there was no candy shots on the way to the principal's office. You were giving up stuff. You were making deals with God. And you didn't even know why you were being called there. And I remember on this one particular day, as I was walking to the principal's office, scared, scared, dragging my feet, not moving quickly at all. And when I got there, I was standing and I was kind of probably shaking, visibly nervous. And I had this moment where I immediately thought that this was going to be the worst thing in the world. And what it came down to is they needed to pass a note on to me that was of a personal nature. And only the principal could give it to me. And it wasn't a bad thing. I wasn't in trouble. I was not going to get the paddle. Not like Don Rennie, who got it bunches of times. I know that. I know. I'm sure he did. He's a big guy. I wouldn't do it today. But anyways, that's another story. But they gave me this news, and it was no big deal. And I had lived in fear all those steps. I had <laughs> done all those things thinking the worst. And sometimes we think to hear the voice of God is to hear the worst. Folks, the voice of God wants to teach you and shape you and mold you and move you and strengthen you and empower you and to love through you and to bless you. But so oftentimes we have this weirdness around authority. We always think the worst. But he is to be the Lord of our lives, the Savior of our soul. He is to be the, our King. And yet when we kind of live in disobedience, not wanting to hear because we live in fear as to what he must say, I've got to tell you there's something wrong in our own lives. There is obviously something that needs to be rooted out and brought before him and laid at his feet. I know sometimes... Sometimes we hear the voice of the Lord and it comes at a very inopportune time. It comes just when we're about to do something that we know we shouldn't do. And we deny that voice in our life and we go and we continue. And what we've effectively done is turned up our own voice and we have put it on par with the voice of God. And we have said, I will listen to my voice and not the voice of the Spirit in my life. Scripture says that you shall have no other gods before him. That includes you. That includes the way you prioritize that which you think is important in your lives. Folks, I know that God wants to do exceedingly good. Scripture says, allow me to read this to you out of, um, well, I'll read both passages. John 16, 24, and says, until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive. And your joy will be complete. That doesn't sound like a meanie God that is waiting to crush you and I. That sounds like a God that wants to do something significant in our life. There's greater, um, it kind of extrapolates this out in Luke chapter 11, 9 to 13. It says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek 
and you will find knock and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be open. And here's, here's what I want you to see in regards to this. Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, now compare this to God, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God, the for Christ is specifically saying here that the Holy Spirit is good. The Holy Spirit is needed and necessary in your life. And the Holy Spirit wants to do something remarkable in your life so that you will have communication with God the Father. Now, sometimes we read the Old Testament and we see the stories of like, uh, Abraham, for instance, who, who had this ongoing dialogue with the Lord, or Moses. It seems like the greats of Scripture were always hearing from God. Do you ever suspect what made them great? Was their ability to hear God in their lives. That's what made them great for the kingdom. And the same is true, and the opportunity is available for each and every one of us today. What can make us great in the kingdom for kingdom purposes his will be done is if we would learn to listen to that which he wants to say and do in our lives. Oftentimes we're either impatient or we just don't like it. And we're fearful of what may be. But I assure you that as we learn to trust him fully and completely and wholly, that he has something, he has plans to prosper you and not to harm you. That's what scripture says. He has plans that, that involve your, 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 your future. And those future plans are to bring glory to him in a powerful way. It's an amazing thing. And yet, unfortunately, it's not a regular practice of ours to hear from God. We maybe relegate that to Sunday morning. But if you really want to move forward in the things of God in 2014, you need to learn to hear Him. Now, I'm not a morning person. I think morning people should get two more hours of sleep, frankly. <laughs> morning people, they're a strange breed. They get up at 4 a.m. and they're happy. They're happy to be up at four. And I, I, think, I think to get up when it's dark is wrong. I think somewhere in Scripture, that's a sin. <laughs> to get up when it's dark, it's, 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 it's wrong. I loved living in Alberta for five years because at certain times in the winter, sun does not come up. No kidding. Ruben, my witness, 840 in the morning on our shortest days, and down by like 20 after 4. It's a short day, right? Problem is, in the summer, flipped. Doesn't get dark till almost 11, and the sun is up at 4.45. But, there is something that happens in my life when I give God prioritized time in my day. You and I have really good intentions all the time, and I have, and we say stuff like this. You know, I'm going to spend time with God today. <coughs> that is the intention of many. But we also say, I'm going to eat well today. We're going to exercise today. I'm going to do everything on my to-do list today. And we've got all this stuff that we want to do, and then we get to the end of the day, and we all of a sudden, we're tired, and we're worn out, and we've done very little, if any, of that stuff that we said that we needed to do. And, and yet... And yet we have time for stuff. And I want to challenge you this next week. And again, this is a brutal challenge for me because I love the nightlife baby. I mean, come on. I mean, you know, I, 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 I want to stay up. I, I just, I, I get a second win about 10 o'clock. Well, not anymore. I'm starting to fall asleep on the couch. What's wrong with that? All right? What is up with that? I am turning into my dad right in front of me. I... <laughs> Bryce looks over. Um... But I look cool. I'm not drooling, at least, right? <laughs> I look good. 
Well, not drooling, but definitely asleep. Definitely asleep. You know, it would be silly of me to take my quiet time with the Lord there. Because that would really be more like bedside Baptist at that moment, right? I wouldn't really be awake. But here's the thing that I've noted about the morning. You know, the dawn happens every day. It's a new day, new opportunities, new possibilities. And you know what's amazing? My head isn't crowded with all kinds of junk. One of the worst mistakes you can do in the morning is to go immediately to your phone and check to see who's angry at you in the middle of the night, right? Or go through your emails and all that kind of stuff because you know what happens? You immediately go someplace else. The morning really is a fantastic time just to be quiet before the Lord and learn to listen. I have a friend who is, um, who is an intercessor, and he prays for hours at a time. But he had young children, and it was tough because he, to, to be able to pray that way for hours, he would sometimes get up and walk, and as he's walking in the house, he's waking the kids because he's praying out loud. And so for years, he prayed in his garage sitting in the front seat of his car. And he would be there from, for many hours a day and he would just pray and be before the Lord and listen. And I got to tell you what, my, my friend Dave, when he tells me he's heard from God, I believe it. Because I know he has. He knows the voice. He's heard it before. He understands the direction of it. He's made a priority of it for his day. And some of you are going... How am I going to do that? At I'm not asking you to do that at 2 o'clock. I'm asking you to carve out 15, 20 minutes. I guarantee if I, look, if I was to do time management on your day, my day too, I could find 20 minutes in your day of wasted time, right? Sure. Why don't we prioritize that time to begin to hear the Lord in our lives? And I'm just suggesting that you take that morning before you check your phone, before you go to emails, before you go to your Twitter account and your Snapchats and everything else, and just hear what the Lord has to say about your day. I challenged you a few weeks ago to say this when you got up, good morning, Holy Spirit. A lady in our Saturday evening service came up last night and said, I have been doing that every single day. And what I didn't realize was this conversation that I am building with the Lord. It just goes on throughout my day. It even gets to the point where the other day I found myself asking him, so how's your day, God? <laughs> and I just kind of smiled and I went. But there was a comfortability being put into her life where she was beginning to dialogue with the Lord and the Lord was dialoguing back with her and she was hearing and she was listening and she goes, I couldn't be more excited. She gets up at 2 a.m. every day. She's a freak of nature. <laughs> but she has found time to prioritize in her day because she has to get up very early for work to be with the Lord and it starts with good morning, Holy Spirit begins the conversation, and then takes time to listen. Folks, be careful with the other voices that you're dealing with. It could be the evil one, it could be yourself, it could be your traditions. Make sure your heart's right. Have a teachable spirit. And begin, if you're going to love people, then you need to begin to respond the way Jesus responded. And if you're going to act like him, then you better know how he acted. And then if we are to listen to him, then we need to be comfortable with his voice, not always thinking that he has a plan to bruise us, but he has a plan to prosper us. Why don't you go ahead and take out your connection card as our worship team comes and finds ourselves into place today. Just a note, I know we ask you about your contact information all the time, but this past week, we recognize that as we were sending out our giving statements before the end of the month, that over 100 of the addresses 
that we have on file for you are incorrect and we update all the time and so would you continue to please update your information for us so we can have that into our database now if you're our guest today we want to thank you very much for being here it's, um, it's super Sunday not just because of the game but because what God wants to do in your life here in these closing moments what he wants to do in all of our lives he wants to speak to us he wants to empower us and he wants to move us forward for his kingdom purposes and so if you're our guest today if you wouldn't mind taking a moment to fill out the front of that card and then when you've had chance <coughs> to do that you'll note that people have already begun writing on the other side and starting to, to work through some of the information for instance next week we have a membership class next Sunday immediately following service we'll be serving lunch and if you would like to be a member here at SJA if you would just take a moment to check that box and we'll make sure we get you on the list and get you all squared away to, to start next week with us all right there are other things on there there's some affinity group stuff that you need to be aware of but I want to direct your attention to your next steps first one Ecclesiastes 5 1 that is your um, that's your memory verse go to the house of the Lord and listen don't offer a fool's sacrifice. Listen. Your extra reading includes the book of Numbers, the story of the snake, and 1 Samuel 3. We didn't even touch on that today. Samuel and Eli, and then Luke chapter 8, the parable of the sower, where we have the illustration of how Satan can snatch away, but it's not snatched away if we have a good heart. Three things. Turn down the voices. Number two, prepare the heart. And finally, listen. Listen. So we go, I don't know. Is God really going to speak to me this week? I think God's going to speak to you now. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads with me. I'm going to pray a prayer of blessing over you. We're going to sing a song. And following that song, I invite my prayer friends to join us here at the front. We know you come with, with needs each and every week. We want to be sensitive to that and available to pray. Well, let me pray first. Father, we thank you for every life that is here in this room. God, I pray that we wouldn't rely on somebody else's word for us. We wouldn't rely on something that we heard or sensed from you back in 1963. But today, we would receive that which is fresh for our soul. It's going to line up with your word. It needs to. It needs to be in tune with the kingdom of God. But God, we want to see today, we want to hear today, that which we have not yet seen or heard. Similar to that experience is when we read a verse and we find a similar verse that we've read many many times and all of a sudden it speaks to us powerfully and we say I never saw that before God I pray that you would speak to us today that way we would see that which we have never seen before even though it's been before us may you open our spiritual eyes to see and Lord our ears to hear is that not what you say to the churches in Revelation may they have ears to hear God, I pray that we would have ears to hear today. And as we go to worship, that we would prepare our heart. We'd be teachable. We'd be in tune with listening. That we'd be cognizant of the voices that are trying to distract us and grab at our attention. All these things in Jesus' name. Would you stand with us as we sing together? Let's sing with all that we've got today as we worship the Lord. Listen, even as you're singing what the Holy Spirit wants to be saying into your life, I'll call you for prayer in just a moment. There's nothing worth more that will ever come close. Nothing can compare. You're our living hope. I've 
taste it and see of the sweetest of lips when my heart becomes free and my shame is under your presence
here at the end of the aisle, if you'd reach down, grab the bucket, pass it along, we will collect these connection cards. Also at this time, I'm going to invite my prayer friends that are here to, to minister to you. If you would come and just be here at the front ready to, uh, to pray with folks that come with whatever, whatever need is on their life today. Folks, this is a great challenge you want to take me up on. Spend time to hear God's voice in your life. You will never go back to just going Sunday or Saturday or whatever it is, week to week, and just catching a nugget here and there. This will create in you an appetite to be with the Lord each and every day. And when you do that, something great comes out of it. I don't know exactly what that is, other than this incredible relationship with God. But something that His purpose comes alive when we live this way. If you've got a prayer need, I'm going to invite you to come at this time. Worship team's just going to sing softly. Otherwise, we'll see you out on the way out. Go Jets! God bless you. Hope to see you out Wednesday night. Thanks for being here. Coming for prayer this direction. Thanks for being here.